is I've subjected the people to many uh, many reports over the years, but uh, and soon I hope to be able to. Um, produce a report looking at the differences between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children in our of home care based on the Pockles data. So it's a very, I think a very interesting and unique um, study. I don't think there's been that much work, um, or I certainly know there hasn't been that, that much work in this area because I had to do a literature review on it recently and I think so it's a very exciting opportunity to talk about some of the preliminary results. I will say these are fairly preliminary, preliminary ugh, terrible word, isn't it? Preliminary, preliminary results, um, which um, will be contextualised and um, analyse them more detail as I get more into the data. I think Aboriginal um, issues are quite complex. Um, there's an overlap between Aboriginal status and kinship care. So Aboriginal children tend to be in kinship care more often than non-Aboriginal children. Uh, many Aboriginal people come from the regional areas more commonly than the metro areas too. And so that there will be a variety of potentially confounding factors which we'll have to look at more carefully when we get into the data. So this is just an overview of the differences between the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children on a range of different areas. So just a quick overview of my talk. Um, I'll just provide a bit of an overview of national research which I put together for a literature review which um, summarises some of the main areas of investigation to this topic over the last probably 10, 15 years. That's been the main sort of period when this sort of work's been done. And a bit of a summary of some of the um, early findings from these preliminary, preliminary analysis. I'll stay away from that word, it's terrible. So um, just a quick overview of the sorts of um, the main key research questions which um, this particular area looks at. So Pockles has a number of key research questions and we, this particular area addresses a number of these. So you can see up here, I'm not sure which way, it's safer for my neck, um, um, looking down is probably safer. Um, it looks at the, the backgrounds and the differences between the different um, children coming into care. So what are the, the differences in the reasons why they come into care, some of the background and risk factors which uh, predate their entry into care. That's, that's an important um, variable which we can look at in conjunction with our, in relation to Aboriginal status because there's a lot of concern about a lot of Aboriginal children coming into care. And so there's a lot of a policy interest in understanding what the risk factors are and whether they might differ um, from other children. Uh, there's a very strong influence in the study um, on, or very, very strong emphasis upon, um, at, as we mentioned before, the developmental outcomes across time. And, and also um, the extent to which the Aboriginal placement principle is being adhered to. This is quite a difficult thing to study because it, it's, you know, the Aboriginal placement principle has a sort of continuum of outcomes from um, you know, being returned to the birth parents right through to um, you know, staying in the community, staying on country and also connection with um, broader culture and community. Um, and so that can be analysed in quite a few different ways and so I'll be presenting just some of the very preliminary uh, looks at that. Other important uh, questions are to do with the trajectories, as Judy mentioned. Um, we've got uh, many measures in here which capture developmental outcomes, looking at those over time. That's one of the unique features of the study. There's been a number of studies around the country that which have done snapshot cross-sectional analyses of how young people in our home care are faring. And I've got Michael Sawyer's work in, in South Australia and compared that with nationally normative data. Here is the first data set, I think, in, in the country uh, which can actually do it longitudinally for kids now of home care. No one's ever done that in Australia to this level of depth. Um, you have to go to America, some of the big Swedish studies, to really get sort of sort of data. And of course, finally, uh, as Judy mentioned, um, contact between young people uh, and their families is fundamental in this area, and particularly in relation to uh, Aboriginal children, particularly when we're reflecting upon the Bringing Them Home report and many other recommendations of those important reports, um, looking at the contact and the extent to which that's maintained across time is, is a fundamental concern for the study. So some of the three research questions I'm going to look at, uh, or principal, uh, I guess, um, I guess foci for my investigation are going to be to do with the, the trajectories of development for the two groups. Um, factors associated with entry into our of home care. I haven't got any of that analysis done yet because that requires a bit more data linkage and data cleaning, which we'll have that very soon, and that'll be the next thing I'll be looking at analysing. But certainly family and cultural connections in our of home care, that's something we have got some data on, which I'll be talking about um, presently. And so just a quick overview of the, the national literature. So what the national literature in this area, which I reviewed um, recently for, for the literature review to do with this, associated with this report, um, you, you'll see that the literature in this area tends to cover these areas. Give you a chance to have a glance through those. 
So in a bit more detail, so there's quite a bit of work out there, Clear Tilbury's work, um, some of the work we did in South Australia, some of the work which the data linkage John Lynch uh, and Fiona Arnie and some of the team in South Australia are looking at now. It's looking at, and of course we, we capture this data quite well with the AIHW data nationally every year. Uh, this data essentially shows the extent to which um, Aboriginal people are, or young people are overrepresented in the out-of-home care system and the child protection system. So um, I think most of us here who work in this area will be familiar with all these statistics. So if you look at um, New South Wales, the race of uh, representation in the out-of-home care system for uh, Aboriginal children is about 10 times or more higher than the non-Aboriginal population. So that's, that's sort of the sort of statistic you see very commonly. And of course the figures for um, notifications are quite starkly different uh, and work we've done in South Australia where we've actually looked at the cumulative um, distribution or the accumulation of child protection notifications for young Aboriginal people from age 0 to 18 years shows that by the age of 18 years um, there are something like 75% of at least one notification so they almost become like a protected population um, through having uh, when you look at it that way. Um, and so that does raise a number of concerns about, you know, um, reflecting upon the past and the extent to which we still are, you know, having a very large involvement in the lives of many Aboriginal families. System outcomes. Um, a bit of work um, has been done on looking at uh, reunification patterns. Elizabeth Fernandez has done some work and, and Elizabeth and I together did that national study where we had a number of different states where we looked at um, hazard models and looked at uh, factors which predicted how fast young people went home. We did an Aboriginal comparisons for Tasmania, Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales and Queensland. And I think um, where we did find differences they weren't almost, always, always in, in favour of Aboriginal children staying in care longer taking longer to be reunified uh, and typically that was because they were more likely to be in kinship care which we know to be associated with, typically with a slower return home. Um, no evidence from any of the studies I've been involved with um, of any differences in placement stability uh, for Aboriginal versus non-Aboriginal children. Typically they tend to have similar placement experiences in that way. Um, as I mentioned, Aboriginal children are much more likely to go into kinship care. And as, for, as I've indicated in the, the first um, Pockles report I wrote on kinship care, you get a lot of Aboriginal um, children placed with other relatives. In fact, there are two distinct, distinct groups. There's the grandparents and also other relatives. And the other relatives, uncles and aunts and so on, are much more likely to be Aboriginal than non-Aboriginal. And to the extent that there's difference between the grandparents and other relatives, you'll have different potentially outcomes for um, young, Abri young Aboriginal people. Um, studies are, have also looked at the number of, total number of risk factors associated with Aboriginal children coming into care. Uh, I've done quite a few of these studies and they very consistently show that the clustering of risk factors tends to be much, um, or you get a lot more risk factors in the Aboriginal families. Um, in studies I've done on infants in South Australia, in the uh, general out-of-home care population studies, the total count of risk factors uh, is, is always been found to be high. Well, it was, was found to be higher in, I think, about 80% of those studies for Aboriginal families, which is consistent with what we know about differences in broader socio socioeconomic disadvantage and other social disadvantage. It's always a, a difficult area to study because so many of these things tend to be clustered and correlated. So when we read about a higher prevalence of uh, substance abuse or um, you know, financial problems, those, they often lead to domestic violence and to homelessness. So when we see all these as separate factors, you often have to sort of say, is it really just back to two or three principal factors, namely you know, um, poverty and financial disadvantage um, you know, mental health issues sometimes and also um, substance use which triggers a clustering of other factors and so often when we see you know, 10 or 12 factors present is it really 12 or the reflection of three bigger ones? Uh, that's, that's an issue. Um, it has, has been found in some studies that uh, Aboriginal children have been found to enter care for the reason of neglect more often than non-Aboriginal children and this sometimes is the case because homelessness is more common um, and so there may be, but there may also be cultural um, biases and definitions and what constitutes neglect too, which has to be looked at when you, you define uh, these types of factors. Neglect can be, uh, you know, saying I don't want to look after the child or child um, neglect might be a judge by someone else that you're not meeting certain parental standards. Um, 
housing standards. So that's, there are important cultural considerations, I think, in looking at variables like that. Uh, cultural connections and contact. As I mentioned, the, the Aboriginal uh, placement principle is fundamental to any of this sort of research. And as I mentioned, this essentially um, is a form of continuum. It, it ranges from all things being equal, children should be placed with their family. If not with family, then with kin. If not, then with um, extended family. On, you know, staying on country, staying close to the community, and then only placed elsewhere with non-Aboriginal carers or foster carers uh, when that's absolutely necessary. Um, and so there's a fundamental um, emphasis, uh, obviously very strong emphasis in the Bring Him Home report on um, remaining cultural connections and sense of identity for Aboriginal people. So any research we do in this area must look to the extent that we can investigate some of these types of variables. One of the important documents that's emerged in the last few years is the Task Force 1000 report in Victoria, which was a, a very detailed case file analysis of um, Aboriginal children in the Victorian out of home care system. It was principally focused on the extent to which the Aboriginal placement principle was being adhered to. Um, and the figures, of course, are fairly pessimistic when you read, when you read some of these summary statistics. Uh, it is the case, if you read in more depth into the report, you realise that there are cases where the department simply wasn't able to get an Aboriginal carer in certain areas. Uh, what might be there were some cases where a decision was made to place them elsewhere for you know, the, the parent might have asked for it. So the statistics might not be quite as damning as they look. There is, once again, some context behind these figures. But certainly the report does provide a very um, important set of secondary recommendations um, and standards which can be uh, applied around the country. And as Judy mentioned, um, there's... Um, looking at developmental outcomes are, of course, fundamentally very important um, in this area. Um, there's been quite a lot of studies around the country looking at, uh, looking at some of these standardised developmental measures um, in a variety of studies comparing Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children. The findings in the general community tend to be fairly consistent, um, that the non-Aboriginal children outscore the Aboriginal children on a range of developmental measures. Um, and, and there are gaps in performance which um, get larger as children grow older. And that's, of course, a fundamental um, issue raised in the, um, you know, all this, you know, what's it, what's it called, um, what's the name of the report? The um, Mending the Gap, what's it called? Mending the Gap? Um, yeah. Closing the Gap, sorry. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Um, a fundamental assumption of that report is that there is a gap that often gets wider. A fundamental um, you know, part of policy is to try and find ways to reduce those differences at the start and also make sure they don't get any larger over time. And so looking at some of the, uh, the very best research in this area, I think the Western Australia Child Health Survey is a particularly good one because it surveyed, I think, several thousand children. It administered the um, SDQ, the Strength and Difficulties Questionnaire, which is sort of a smaller version of the, a bit like the CBCL measures, the conduct disorder and measures like that. Um, it, it showed that the Aboriginal um, children typically scored, are more likely to score in the clinical range than non-Aboriginal children. And Aboriginal parents are much more likely to have a variety of health problems, birth complications, and other sort of medical conditions which um, created challenges for them. So that's, so that's quite a bit of work out there uh, in the general community. Aboriginal carers, um, there's research out there showing that, um, as we know, Aboriginal kids are more likely to be placed with kinship carers. Um, in studies of um, Aboriginal carers, it's generally been shown that Aboriginal carers have a number of strengths. Uh, there's, a, there's a very strong sense of community. There's a strong sense of a willingness to help others in their community. Uh, there's an awareness of what happened in the past and often a willingness to, to take children into your home so as to avoid them being taken off country. So there is some research out there with some positive messages. Uh, at the same time, if kids are more likely to be placed in kinship care, um, we also know that kinship carers have certain challenges which are not um, possessed by foster carers. We know that kinship carers often have lower incomes and, and, other, and often tend to be older too, particularly their grandparent carers, which makes, the, um, makes caring a little bit more challenging for them. Uh, so that's an important consideration too. Um, so if Aboriginal kids are more likely to be kinship carers, um, we need to take those factors into account. So some of the particular hypotheses um, you can look at in relation to um, this topic based on this national research is, for example, we might expect that Aboriginal kids are not doing as well uh, developmentally than um, uh, non-Aboriginal kids. That's one thing we can look at in the POCOLS data. We can also look to see whether the trajectories 
widen over time, as the, the community data sets seem to suggest. Uh, we can also look... Um, we can also explore the extent to which the Aboriginal placement principle was being addressed by the, uh, the New South Wales system. As I said, I've only very, made very preliminary investigations into this so far, and we can look at this in quite a lot of depth. Uh, not only look at whether they're placed with Aboriginal carers, we can also look at other members of the family and other factors as well. And um, as J Judy was showing before, we can look at uh, differences between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children in the, in the trajectories of family contact. Um, is there any evidence that Aboriginal children are losing contact with their, their parents um, over time? That's another thing we can do. So the data sources for the analyses which I'll be presenting today are from the Wave 1 to 3, um, from Waves 1 to 3, uh, and they're principally from the case, uh, the case interview, or the carer interview, sorry, and also the facts administrative data was used to validate the uh, identified children as Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal. So 1,479 um, children uh, were included in the, uh, this particular uh, set of analyses. So that, that, that they completed at least one um, survey at one of those three waves. And I think it's about 870 or so um, children uh, had data at all three waves. And you can see there's no difference in, uh, in gender differences in the, the two groups. So there's no danger of the results being confounded by, uh, by gender. And the mean age of the children at wave one was five. And so by the age of, uh, by the third wave, they're, on average they'd be about eight years old. So, but obviously there's a bit of a distribution of um, different ages. But gen generally we're talking about fairly young children in, in these analyses. So developmental trajectories. Um, as was mentioned before, um, the, the Pockles data set has a series of standardised, of standard dom domains which we're looking at in relation to um, health and well-being and development over time. This ranges from physical health through to socio-emotive problems um, to um, cognitive ability, verbal ability. And so what I've done is, is look at, uh, have a, uh, sort of a basic look at the, um, how Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children are faring over time uh, in relation to, the, to these different measures. So physical health, 98% um, of children, as we mentioned before, here, um, is, uh, are doing very well uh, in relation to their physical health. They're, they're very healthy, excellent or very good uh, health. Uh, only 2% um, poor to very poor fare. And so scores of one mean that you're excellent. And I didn't put a zero on the origin for this simply because the, uh, it would sort of pretty much uh, be scraping along the, uh, yeah, uh, the bottom. Uh, but there's no difference between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children in their physical health as rated by the carers. And, and no evidence, uh, despite the slight sort of downward trajectory of that line, that's a very, very small number of units of change, um, no significant change in their physical health from um, wave one to three. The principal developmental measures, um, as Judy mentioned, we've got the child behaviour checklist, which of course is a very detailed measure with a lot of subscales, but which can be aggregated to an overall total problem score or the internalising scores, which are of course the depression, anxiety and those types of problems. And then you've got externalising, uh, which refers to hyperactivity, conduct disorder and those types of problems. And the ages and stages questionnaire, which measures uh, the extent to which children are meeting various developmental milestones in different areas at different ages. And that's for sort of the younger children, aged nine to, yep. So the not, typically with the CBCL, uh, about 15% of the population will score um, in the uh, clinical range. That's a bit like a reference point, um, which you can use when, when looking at the, the Pockles data. So when we look at um, the CBCL internalising, Aboriginal children, 15% at wave one, 40% at wave three. They're pretty much similar to a normal population. Non-Aboriginal children went down. They got better over time. But once again, end up rounding up not far from that 15%. Externalising. Um, this is where the overall total problem scores are higher than the general population, but it's mostly coming from externalising. So you can see that the actual prevalence of externalising problems is double what you see in a normative population in both groups. Once again, non-Aboriginal children um, went down a little bit more than um, the Aboriginal children. 
So these, these, these are the um, raw scores. So it's, a, it's a trend towards improvement. Verbal ability, no significant difference between Aboriginal and um, non-Aboriginal children, and the scores are generally stable over time. Similarly with the WISC matrix reasoning, um, the scores didn't change over time. Aboriginal children scored slightly lower on this measure than did the non-Aboriginal children, but no evidence that the gap was widening over time. The ASQ, um, all these measures pretty much showed that the trajectories for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children were pretty much um, consistent across time, uh, characterised by a, an increase and then stabilisation. So you'll see, for example, for personal and social, Communication, fine motor skills, pretty much stable across time, no significant differences between the um, two groups. Gross motor, slight increase, stable, very, very similar um, for both groups. Problem solving. Once again, upward trajectory, trajectory very similar for the two groups. We also had some measures looking at cultural and family connections. Now, the Aboriginal placement principle, we found that 42% um, were placed with Aboriginal households, but this may, and this did not change significantly from wave one to three, but it may well be um, that when we look at other, rel other relatives in the household, other people in the households, this figure might be higher. And of course we can look at kinship care as well, which may make the figure uh, quite a lot higher. If we look at uh, measures such as whether the birth, na uh, birth name was uh, maintained across time, it's gone from 91% to 98% across the three waves. Birth language maintained, 53% to 69%, it's improving. Cultural heritage discussed by the carer. It's gone up 56 to 79 per cent across time. Socialising with the birth community, it's gone from 42 to 66 per cent across time. Cultural activities and festivals involvement, 42, I think it's 82 per cent. So all these things are going to be increasing across time. Awareness that these are important things to um, be maintained. So this works better. And so generally, carers felt that they were able to maintain the cultural um, connections quite well in the study. 96% uh, said very well or fairly well. And 73% uh, of carers were helping out with cultural plans at wave three. I'll just quickly skip through these. Um, the, overall, there was a trend towards greater contact um, with um, supervised, unsupervised contact with mum. This one was going down. Contact, telephone contact was going up. Unsupervised contact with dad was going up. That one was going down. So in summary, developmental outcomes look very similar. Um, cultural connections seem to be quite well maintained. And there do, does appear to be a reason, no obvious evidence that contact with family was dropping off over the three waves. So the results so far from these preliminary analyses are reasonably positive, I think, in relation to how Aboriginal kids are doing in care. And so it's a little bit rushed, it's got a lot of material to get through, um, but once we do the report, obviously we'll have a lot more chances to, to read through the stuff in more depth. But anyway, thanks for that. I hope I'll give, give you a few ideas what we're doing.